Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be holy and pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In these last few weeks, I have been in many conversations that talked about the most recent Gallup poll. It has been mentioned in conversations with my colleagues, with pastor friends, and at last week's presbytery meeting. It's been mentioned in conversations I have with my non-religious friends. U.S. church membership has fallen below the majority for the first time in Gallup's eight-decade trend. 47% of Americans say they belong to a religious community in comparison to 70% in 1999. In fact, when Gallup first measured it in 1937, it remained at nearly 70% for the next six decades. Of course, this is just data requiring interpretation. And questions come up, and the most commonly one I have heard most is why? Why are less people identifying as religious? Did the power of the good news change in the last seven decades? Are people just less interested in religion? Why, 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 why is church membership down? It was this last question that I asked that brought into light the new question I've been asking. What does it mean to be, what does it mean to be a member of the church? And when I look at our church governance, I see that as Presbyterians, we have taken the time to think through of what it means to be a member as we, we even have four categories of membership. And if you want to be an active member of the PCUSA, it requires action on one's end. You have to choose to go through a process to profess your faith in Christ, to voluntarily submit to the government of this church, and participate in a church's work and worship. You have to personally choose to go through a process to be accepted and identified as an active member of this church. And while there are criteria that needs to be met for some of these membership statuses, I also see that our tradition still holds a posture of welcome and inclusivity as people are not required to be members of the PCUSA to participate in the life and worship of this church. We affirm you don't need to be a formal member to be in this community, to receive the invitation to the table, as our book of order states, remembering that access to the table is not a right conferred upon the worthy, but a privilege given to the undeserving who come in faith, repentance, and love. This desire for welcome and inclusivity is one of the reasons why I desired to identify as a member of the PCUSA. It resonated with some of my core tenets in understanding of what faith is, of this radical inclusivity found in Christ. And I wonder, for some of you, what your why is. Why do some of you choose to become members of this community? Which made me think, for those who aren't electing to become members of the church, is there some action in that choice too? Is there some decision making for people who are electing to say, I don't want to be a church member. I don't want to be identified with the church or with Christianity. 
It makes me wonder what others perceive the church to be or what they think of its criteria. Do they see it as barriers, boundaries of who can be considered in and who is out? For even though I think the church is an inclusive and welcoming space, I do know that others have not experienced this and have not perceived the church as inclusive and welcoming. Many hear that the church is welcoming, but then find out they aren't fully welcomed just because they are part of the queer community. In fact, it wasn't until this last decade that my queer siblings could become ministers in the PCUSA. And in 2018, the 223rd General Assembly of the PCUSA voted to affirm its commitment to the full welcome, acceptance, and inclusion of transgender people, people who identify as gender non-binary, and people of all gender identities within the full life of the church and the world. Friends, I think, I think many people are not identifying as Christians, as members of churches, because many have experienced exclusion. But I believe the Holy Spirit is moving us, calling us to a radical exclusion, inclusion that has already been named in Christ. The Holy Spirit is calling us to bring this to fruition, to remove barriers and boundaries, and for it to be known and proclaimed, for it to be boldly named and proclaimed. And we aren't alone in this work. For the good news of Christ that removes barriers and moves us to freedom is also the work we find in our text today. It's a powerful story of inclusion, a powerful witness to how the church itself was being reformed. For we find Philip, Philip being called by an angel of the Lord. And this is important because there are only three other instances in Acts when an angel of the Lord speaks to a character in Acts 5, 10, and 27. And as Sean Burke speaks to this, in the rhetoric of the book of Acts as a whole, then, angels speak to important characters in order to tell them what to do at key moments in the mission of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. When the mission in Jerusalem is threatened by persecution, when Peter is called upon to extend the mission to Cornelius, and when Paul's mission to Rome is under threat, that the story of the Ethiopian eunuch is initially shaped by the report of an angel of the Lord speaking to Philip, thus suggests that this story also represents a key moment in the mission of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. A key moment in the mission of the proclamation, for we see in this text how inclusion is extended further than we could imagine. For Philip, Philip is led by the Spirit to chase after the stranger. Indeed, God is chasing the Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip runs to the eunuch who is reading from Isaiah 53, who then voices he needs a guide. And as William James Jennings puts it, this is the key moment where God is revealed intersecting and intercepting the identity of this writer. For the text he's reading is one of disgrace and pain, one he may res resonate with, indeed resonate with the Christ who faced humiliation. For the eunuch is known for his difference, for his existence in the margins. He's castrated, a gender variant foreigner. In ancient times, biblical eunuchs could stand for all sexual minorities. Eunuchs served as keepers of the bed, and many eunuchs were able to hold higher offices as they were not considered a threat to women in royal and wealthy households. Yet while he oversaw the treasury of Candace, 
a possible insider in his own context, he still holds a marginalized space in the faith he seeks to embrace. For we gather that the Ethiopian eunuch is a God-fearing person, having just come from Jerusalem from desiring to worship at the temple. The scholarship mostly affirms that the temple held close to the Deuteronomy and Levitical law, that castrated males were excluded from entering the assembly of the Lord. Furthermore, if he is a Gentile God-fearer, he still can't even go beyond the courts of the Gentiles. He still, nonetheless, exists not only in the margins of his context, but in the margins of his faith, possibly gathering from Scripture that he's not fully welcomed. There is so much about his identity, his sexuality, his foreignness, his otherness, that destabilize the constructs and barriers created. For the eunuch, the eunuch is not reading from Deuteronomy or Leviticus, but he's reading Isaiah, who in Isaiah 11:11 11, 11, announces that God will, will recover the remnant that is left of his people from Ethiopia. In Isaiah 56, eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths will be welcome in the house of God and will receive a name better than sons and daughters. I can only imagine that as the eunuch is reading from Isaiah 53, he wonders how this word impacts his life, for he knows about humiliation, knows about justice denied. And here lies the good news, my friends. For Philip shares with the eunuch the good news of Jesus, of the one who took a lowly and outcast state, who was humiliated on the cross. Philip shares the good news of the one who walked the road of suffering, who is exalted to the name above all names, and who we find redemption, restoration, and hope. Philip tells him, of the Christ who removed barriers and boundaries, the fulfillment of God's ongoing promise. Indeed, it is good news, possibly better news, that the Ethiopian could have imagined, expected, and now experiences. He is beloved, a child of God, and any identity markers he carried could not restrict him in finding the freedom of Christ. Indeed, finding the freedom and embracing in the good news of Christ. Hallelujah. This is indeed a key moment in the mission of the proclamation of the good news. For we see how the good news is inclusive, extended further. Truly, the Holy Spirit guides this encounter. For in the wilderness, they come across water. And it's a holy question, a daring question, a question that has enduring impact. What is to prevent me from being baptized? Y'all with me? Y'all been hearing all the barriers I have shared that could keep him from being baptized? Let me give you another voice as Thomas Long speaks to what would keep him from this God encounter. He was living in Ethiopia for one thing, so he was cut off from the land of Israel. He was a eunuch and thus in violation of the purity code. He was a member of the cabinet of the queen of Ethiopia, therefore loyal to the wrong sovereign. He belonged to the wrong nation, held the wrong job, possessed the wrong sexuality. But Philip heard the voice of the Holy Spirit speak a different answer to the man's question. What is to prevent me from being baptized, asked the eunuch. Absolutely nothing, whispered the spirit. Absolutely nothing. So the eunuch commanded a chariot to stop, and he was baptized right on the spot. Walls of prejudice and prohibition that had stood for generations came tumbling, blown down by the breath of God's Holy Spirit. 
And another man who felt lost and humiliated was found and restored in the wideness of God's grace in Jesus Christ. The eunuch. The eunuch goes forth rejoicing. And I can't help but wonder how this God moment has impactful consequences. For Philip, I believe, is also converted and is also changed. For in his proclamation of the good news, he witnessed radical inclusion. And I can't help but think what this means for the community of believers, for they're going to have to deal with Philip's action. A complete outsider, a gender-variant person, could not be held from being baptized and being a full participant in God's people. He wasn't expected to suddenly adhere to gender norms, to any barrier or boundary, but instead he is included and named beloved. Even when society and religion named him as an outsider, the kingdom of God contradicts this and welcomes him in. I see today how we as a larger church are still wrestling with the impact of Philip's actions. The exclusion of trans people, our queer siblings, those who exist in the margins of our society cannot be held back from the movement of the spirit to be welcomed in. If there is any space in our society where inclusion of our queer siblings should exist, it is in the church. It's in the body of Christ in which truly no identity marker can keep one from being baptized, from being a beloved child of God. That this is the good news. This is our challenge today to proclaim boldly the radical inclusion, the freedom that comes in the name of Christ, that knows of no barriers and boundaries. This is the challenge to wrestle with the actions of Philip, with the movement of the Spirit, that no one is expected to change who they are, but instead are welcomed precisely because of who they are as beloved children of God. This is a time to name that the church does not exclude, indeed includes all in full participation, so that we may live into the kingdom of God here today. And I think that it is our duty to change the narrative seen in our society that when someone is deciding whether or not they want to be identified as Christian, they see no barriers or boundaries, but only see and hear, you are welcomed here. Nothing prevents you from being baptized and being named as beloved by God to live in the freedom found in Jesus Christ. May the Holy Spirit continue to guide us to go forth rejoicing in the radical inclusion found in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.